Do you love the fragrance of Provence? We'll show you where you can find it right here in our own backyard, right here on Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. We are out here today at Barn Owl Nursery and they are opening up their gardens to the public. And I have to say they have some wonderful display gardens of lavender, so you can certainly buy lavender or you can buy a great selection of other plants. Plus they have a beautiful gift shop. And later in the show, I'll be talking to Chris about some lavenders that do well in our area. Also coming up on the show today, we're going to be going out to the Portland Japanese Gardens and showing you the Japanese iris, which are in full bloom. We'll also be taking you south to Gosler Farms and talking about wonderful rhododendrons with unique foliage. But coming up first, wonderful plants to make tea from. Well, I am down at the wonderful Garland Nursery and I am here with Ryan. And Hello. Ryan, you've given classes on how to make tea and which plants we use for that purpose. So we thought it'd be great to have a conversation with you about those plants. And I have to say right off the bat, I've always heard it was Camellia sinensis. That's what everybody makes tea from, which is true, but you have some other options as well. Of course, yeah. Any, um, if it's truly a tea, it's going to be from the Camellia sinensis okay. or the Camellia sinensis asomica, which is a larger leaf, warmer um, variety of the Camellia sinensis. But um, the Camellia sinensis is the one we'll do well here in the valley. So we're going to cover some other ones that actually make tea, but let's start with the one that so many people do know of. Tell me about this and, 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 and how it lives, first of all. How do you grow it in your own garden? Well, they grow, it's um, real similar to all the ornamental camellias you see growing around town. They're going to like slightly acidic soil. Right. And um, they do need a fair amount of sun, but protection from the afternoon shade is ideal for it. So Ryan, what part of the camellia would you use for tea? For camellias, you want to get the spring flush, and the highest quality is the first flush, and it would be the top two leaves and the bud. You would take that off of each flush, like here's another flush over here, so you would pinch that off, two leaves and a bud. And then that also encourages the plant to produce new growth, so right. you'll get a second flush in about 7 to 15 days and then you take that one. The highest quality is always your first picking though. That so, has, I, is highest quality the most flavor? Is that what you mean, that kind of Yeah, intensity? the most flavors okay. and it's just what's been prized for thousands of years is the first flush picking. And then you, uh, at this display, this great display here at Garland, mm -hmm. you have Grow Your Own Tea, but there are so many plants here, so let's go over a few of them at least. Okay. Pick out the ones that you love and tell me the same process. How do you keep them in the garden? How do you plant them? And then what, when do you pick and what do you use for the tea? Okay, well, we could go to the Ragosa next. And um, roses are used in teas uh, for ages. The one you want to use for rose hips, which has like the vitamin C and that nice right. tart flavor, right is the Rosa Ragosa because it forms really nice hips. And does that mean you shouldn't use other hips or it's just this one we know the, over time is you great You can use it. any of the hips. It's just this one will form the biggest and um, most flavorful of the hips for Which then is completely contrary to the camellia because this is the spring growth of leaves, but then yeah, no, it's all the part. <laughs> yeah, you use different parts from uh, different plants at different times. So. And I saw you looking at this, which is one of the plants I love. This also is one that will make tea. It is, yeah. Um, you can make tea out of uh, almost anything that's really? not toxic, actually. And how, but, would that, um, how would that be in the garden, though? Is it is any, anything special in the planting, or is it just what it does? Most of the herbs are going to be um, sun lovers, um, and they're going to want some decent drainage. You want to group your herbs together and with similar growing habits, like rosemary and lavender do well together right. because they both like really good draining soil. And, and what is this plant? This is a lemon verbena. It'll uh, impart a nice, uh, strong lemony flavor to any tea. And you can mix this with your other herbals, or you can mix them with black teas as well. Perfect. If you wanted to add a little lemon flavor to a black tea, lemon verbena would be an excellent choice. But this one, just full sun, a nice uh, soil with a compost to break up the clay that most people have here in the valley. Tell me that the tea will <laughs> will smell at least as good as the leaves. It will indeed, <laughs> yeah. With this one you just take the leaves off and then um, 
You can dry them in a food dehydrator or just kind of dry them out on a counter. If anything ever starts to mold though, you want to toss that out oh, okay. and start over again. And would that be because it's not dry enough so the mold takes over? I mean, what's... Uh, it could be, yeah. You want, uh, if the air around it's too humid, then that can cause molding. Um, if you're drying outside, like if you tie it up and hang it yeah. and you dry it outside, which is my preferred method, you'll want to bring it in at night so it doesn't get dew on it. That would make sense. And then just hang it back outside the second day. It usually takes about two days on a warm day. So tell me about this one, Ryan. This one is, um, many people already have this in their gardens. It's grown highly as an ornamental. It's echinacea. And um, not only is it a beautiful plant, but it's been used uh, for thousands of years in folk remedies. It's an immune booster. And on this one, you can use the leaves uh, some of the flower, the petals, um, and then also in the fall you can use the root, wow. which has wow. the, the most health benefits because um, when it goes dormant in the, in the fall, winter, it t sends all of its nutrients down right. to the root right. to store over the winter. So if you're digging up those roots, you're getting the biggest. That would be the time. So mm -hmm. if you're going to use the leaves and stuff, that can yep. be spring. But if you want to use, use the, the leaves, leaves later, um, leave enough for the plant to continue sure. growing, sure. obviously. But you can use the leaves off and on throughout the growing season. And then when it starts to go dormant, you can dry the roots and make a tea out of that that's more potent than a spring. Wonderful. Gathering. Well, there you have it. Now, if you love tea, you love gardening and you want to do both together, you can always come down here to Garland. You can find the plants here and then, you know, he does work here so you can even look him up and get more information on how you can make your own tea in your own garden. Ryan, what a pleasure, my friend. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Over the 30 years that our family has been in the nursery industry, we've learned that anyone can supply a customer with plants and garden supplies. But it's supplying those plants and supplies backed by a knowledgeable staff that can transform a garden and take it from ordinary to extraordinary. That's what we do at Sagawa Nursery. Why be ordinary when you can be extraordinary? Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. Since 1982, The Wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, The Wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials, including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. I am at Down to Earth in downtown Eugene with Chris. And Chris, you're the buyer here, the plant buyer, and you've selected some perennials that you really love. So what did you choose for us? Well, today, uh, one of my new favorites is this Veronica that just came in called Very Van Gogh. <laughs> Fun. What a beauty, right? So you've got this beautiful, nice, tight spike along with all these secondary spikes coming up. So nice repeat bloomer, full sun, you know, 18 to 24 inches. It's a beauty for, you know, hummingbirds and bees and you name it. It's a beauty, yeah. And really for this time of the year, this is going to go on for the rest of the summer, maybe just a little deadheading? All through the summer, I, I wouldn't be shy to have a, yeah, deadheading is perfect. Keep it going. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And then an echinacea, there's really a lot of new echinaceas yeah. on the market. So many beautiful ones. So this sombrero series. This one is the uh, Salsa Red. Mm -hmm. What a beauty, like fire engine red. Beautiful, beautiful plant for bees, hummingbirds, you name it. W lots of nice branching. Uh, one of the things I just mentioned with you was that when I plant echinaceas out in the garden, I tend to mix in a nice bit of uh, pumice oh, so that they drain well. Mm -hmm. um, echinaceas, while they like to stay evenly moist, can get a little bit of a problem with winter wet and rot. So pumice kind of helps that. Excellent. Drain. And then one of my favorites, I love it for later in the garden, yeah. um, the Rudbeckia. Yeah. So, you know, this is kind of an old standard, but truly, whether you're a new gardener or you're an old gardener, goodness, this plant just performs like crazy. Full sun, 
neglect thrives on neglect really <laughs> <like that. laughs> and one of the nice things with this plant too is the winter of fall and winter interest if you leave those seed heads on lots and lots of goldfinches and pine siskins yeah ah oh, great and you have some other ones in the shade area so let's go over there you bet all right and now two favorites for the shade garden two favorites for the shade garden one of them is this aclonochloa grass the uh, japanese forest grass beautiful grass for the shade really lovely a lot of people who kind of want to light up an area in a shade uh, garden this plant does it i have three or four in my oh, garden beautiful. and boy they really really highlight spots in the garden that really kind of turn your head to like wow what is that yeah that is beautiful nice. and then this one's silver so oh. another one to lighten up the garden yeah you know, you almost can't say enough about this plant because truthfully, it's deer resistant. There's oh, a lot of fun. You know, here in Eugene, we do have a lot of deer. But um, again, for shade, dappled or filtered, full sun is great as well if it gets some moisture. But boy, it throws out a beautiful little spike of a forget-me-not type of flower. So Very lovely. Nice. Yeah. And that foliage. Uh, it is stunning. It's really pretty. Really nice. Yeah. Your building here is just so interesting. It's so historic. So we're going to go inside and talk to Rachel about this wonderful building. Thanks so awesome. much. Awesome. You bet. Well, now I'm inside the store with Rachel. And Rachel, this is a very historic building. So give us a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, our building was actually built in the 1920s, finished in the 40s. And we've got a wonderful backdrop to our business with the original Douglas fir floors. And if you're interested, we also have a walking tour. And I saw there's belts and there's shoots and things like that. So really, you can see what it was like when it was a actual seed place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as I was walking around, I noticed it's not just about the plants outside. You have kitchen things, you have home decor, clothing. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, we've got um, kitchen and canning and great gifts, candles, house plants. You know, it's pretty much anything anything under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also for our lifestyle too, and you really keep it like a community. So really it's for everyone to, in Eugene to come on down and visit. We'd love it if you came to visit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I do notice too that you have this huge amount of different kinds of fertilizers for our plants, and those are organic. So the Down to Earth brand is also packaged down here. It is. We make our all of our fertilizers locally. And they're organic also. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a huge line of things. It's not just plants. We all love plants, but it's all things that's for the inside of our homes, too. So if you're in the Eugene area, downtown Eugene, you have to stop in. Come and see the staff. They're really lovely people, too. And if you need any more information, go to Garden Time, and we'll click you over their website. Well, thanks so much for inviting us. Thank you. So I'm standing here with Adam at the Portland Japanese Gardens in one of the more beautiful places happening right now. But first of all, Adam, tell me what is it that you do here? I am the senior gardener here. Wonderful. So we are in irises right now. Mm -hmm. First of all, tell me where these are at in the garden and then tell me a little bit about this variety of, rose, of irises. So we are right now in the Strolling Pond Garden, which is one of the five different gardens here at the Portland Japanese Garden. Uh, we're in the lowest part of the Strolling Garden um, at our what we call the lower pond uh, with the Heavenly Falls off to the side and we're standing on what we call the zigzag bridge. And tell me about these. How did they get here? Tell me some history about them and what they are. So this is Japanese iris. Uh, the Latin name is Iris Ensada. Uh, there are a few different types of iris that are called Japanese iris. So uh, this one is specifically Ensada iris. They are traditional in Japanese gardens. You'll see them in gardens in Japan, uh, often set around a pond because uh, they're native to Japan and they grow uh, in bog settings there. And I see a couple of different colors, but generally it's all one color. And why, why was it done that way? How long ago did they get planted? They were planted, I believe, when this garden was built, which would have been in the late 60s or early 70s. Wow. Uh, back then there weren't different varieties available uh, very much in the trade so what you see is the traditional uh, species of Japanese iris. Uh, you'll see a few other colors mixed in between that are uh, cultivars that were probably added later. Later on and you know I've been here so many times mm -hmm. I have never seen this and I'm thinking how did I miss it? Is it, is it only for a day or two? Uh, Tell yeah. me about why it's all blooming right now. So a lot of people do tend to miss the mm -hmm. irises here because they bloom a little bit later than most of the other plants in our garden. We like to say that uh, peak bloom here is around Mother's Day, but these tend to bloom around mid-late June and into early July. They don't last a terribly long time. Uh, the peak is really for just about a week, maybe two. 
And so let's say that I, I, I have a little pond at home. Mm -hmm. I want to do these around my pond. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you guys do that is special or unique to how you care for them? The Japanese iris do take a bit of care. Uh, they, you have to do things right to get them to flower. Uh, most importantly, they need a lot of sun. If you put them in shade, they won't grow. Right. Uh, they can handle part shade, but they probably won't flower very well. They also really like fertilizer. Uh, to get these big flowers, they need a lot of nutrients. So we will uh, put compost on top yearly to help uh, add to that. And what time of year do you do that generally? We do that in the fall after we cut them back. That's the best time to do it. And uh, then it can incorporate uh, over the next few months. And then it's ready for the spring. And then the most important thing with the Japanese iris is they need water. They need a lot of water. They're a bog plant, so it makes right. sense. They need a lot of water in the spring. That's what's really gonna help them to flower. If, if it's dry through the spring, they won't flower for you. So they like it wet in the spring and then they like it damp through the rest of the summer. Wow. But they don't want to be damp in the winter. Oh yeah, okay. So good drainage is also important. They like loose, friable soils. Well, you know, if you've never been out to see these amazing blooms of the Japanese iris, I suggest that you go to gardentime.tv. We'll click it over their website, find out the hours, how you can get here and view them because they are absolutely breathtaking. Adam, my friend, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. 1,112, 1,113. William, what are you counting? I'm counting all of our wonderful friends on Facebook. And we invite everyone to go to Facebook and like us and follow us. All you have to do is go to gardentime.tv and hit the Facebook icon, which is in the top right hand corner. It's the best place to get the most updated information on Garden Time. So all you have to do is click us and like us. Stages, 25 shows, one sweet weekend. It's the 26th annual Oregon Jamboree presented by Boulder Falls Inn, starring oh, Brett Eldridge, so Brantley Gilbert, Marin Morris, Low Cash, Jared Neiman, and Diamond Rhea. One more day. The Oregon Jamboree happening August 3rd through the 5th. Tickets and camping on sale now at OregonJamboree.com. So it is a great joy for me to be standing in the Owens Memorial Rose Garden out here in Eugene. And now tell me your name and what position do you have here? I'm Daphne Sampson and I'm a Park Specialist 3 and I'm the field lead here for the Rose Garden. And I have to say, you know, we, we're so used to the, the International Rose Test Garden in Portland, but we I'd forget that there are so many beautiful rose gardens in so many cities. And I had not heard of this, so we were delighted to be here. Tell me a little bit of the history, how it came about. So in the 50s, George Owen, who owned this original piece of property, donated approximately three and a half acres of land to the city of Eugene. He was a city councilman. Uh -huh. And um, his house was here and donated a handful of roses. And then over the years, there's more properties been sure. added in. Because clearly then he loved roses. I think, he, I think he loved roses and I think he just recognized the need for a special for some, gem sure. that need, you know, a rose garden for Eugene. And so then over time now, I was reading some information about this place and it started out with like 1,200 roses at one time, but now you're over 4,000 roses here. Over 4,000 roses, 400 dif over 450 different species. We have a huge old garden section and that's really what's put this this garden on the map. If you look in a book of old rose gardens of the world, uh -huh. little old Owen Memorial Rose Garden in Eugene, Oregon is in there <laughs> because of our old heritage collection. Right, right, They're lovely. So, and then we're standing in a more modern part of the garden. This is the modern right? formal garden, this area here. 
And as you can see, it looks quite beautiful Stunning. as well, and right. a lot of bloom and a lot of color. And it's ironic that this is in the modern garden because you were also well known to many people about the tree behind us, which is a very, very old heritage, heritage cherry tree, right? State heritage cherry tree. And it's missed, it blooms in March and, or March, April, depending on the season. Yeah. Um, we just had the fence put around it to help protect the tree. We're working on a tripod system to upgrade the, the current stands to just help hold the tree and, and you know, keep it main, maintained. And there's still all kinds of things that occur. I mean, you do have, you have wedding events here. You have people. We, in fact, when we drove in, there was a group of ladies bringing their lunch to yes. eat over there. That yes. was adorable. Yes. So tell me, there's some activity going on around where the weddings are at, though. There's some changes there happening. What's that? So in the area around the gazebo is all new, renovated, old garden roses. Um, in the past, it was kind of a perennial and really more this, perennials than roses. More perennials. Right? <laughs> it was all perennials, and really, what this garden needs is there. In the past, there was a lot of old garden roses here that have they, kind they of got been old. lost. Yeah, They've they, been they lost, have. and we want to bring those back. And so that's the, what you guys are doing now. That's the huh? direction this garden needs to go. And then you know, I, I, I know that you work in the garden, but this is so beautiful. It can't be done alone. How do you how do you get people here? So there's two staff <laughs> people that work here: myself and my coworker. And we have one volunteer work party a month with about five to six volunteers, so we can welcome volunteers. And it's the second Thursday of each month from nine to noon. You know, every garden is beautiful year round, but there is a specific time for roses. When is that time of yes. blooming? Yes, so pretty much starting in about mid-May to end of June, first part of July. I would, wouldn't push it past that for the full bloom of the whole garden. Well, you know, we are so fortunate at Garden Time to see so many beautiful, wonderful gardens and to find this one in Eugene is delightful. But I have to say, every one of those wonderful gardens has volunteers. So if you love roses or if you just love to be outside, uh, for more information on how you can volunteer and for more on information on the hours and when you can come out and see this wonderful place, go to gardentime.tv. We will click you over to the Eugene Parks Department website. You can get all that information or sign up to volunteer. Daphne, really such a delight, my friend. Thank you, Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much for this. I'm at Little Baja today with Wayne, and Wayne, uh, we usually come for, you see your fountains, you see your pottery, but you have a tremendous amount of piñatas here. Yeah, yes we do. We bring them up from uh, Mexico on top of our planters that we uh, put in the trailer. It's cool because you fill that whole truck, so it's really economical to fill that space with something really light. Yeah, well we have a limit on weight we can put in with the Mexican uh, clay, and so that dead space we fill with our piñatas. And so I see you have different kinds here, but I saw this one. This kind of looks antique. So what is, what is this Well, about? me and my wife, uh, Gloria, we picked that up uh, some 30 years ago as kind of a, a novelty. This is the way they used to do them. Uh, used to clay pot, and of course the danger of having flying terracotta <laughs> rolling around is, so they switched to paper mache, and actually our family really kind of uh, improved the pinata over the regular pinatas that you find down there. And, uh, We've been buying from them now for over 30 years, and uh, we watched the little kids grow up, and now the little kids make pinatas for us. That is cool. And so I know that there's a little bit of rules, so kind of tell us about the rules about pinata play. Uh, basically, uh, no more than three pounds of anything you're going to put in it, whether it's adult toys or candy or whatever you want to do. You, it's an outdoor event, not mostly because you're swinging a heavy object around to break it. You can it. put it in a garden. And you hang it from a tree and pull it up and down. Uh, usually the person, if they're over seven years old, you want to blindfold them so they don't get a good swing at it. Any, uh, anybody older than 10 is just going to hit this thing, you know. But it's a good solid pinata. It's not impossible to break. You don't need a chainsaw, but it's a real pinata. And these are the pinatas that are the most favorite uh, down there in Mexico now. And I see that you sell bats too, and this is a plastic bat, so that don't use anything wooden, right? You don't want to use anything that you don't want to be hit with. Uh, right, right. Okay. So. And I understand too, it's kind of an art form, and you were invited to the art museum many years ago. Uh, we were. Portland Art Museum invited us down for their Mexican festival, and uh, we're the only pinata that I know of that was uh, displayed in with all the other uh, highly prized pieces of art down there. And we did a pinata party and explained uh, how pinatas worked and helped talk about Mexico and the art that they make down there. And uh, there were several other artisans down there besides us. 
It is yeah. cool. Well, there's a, a rich tradition about piñatas and parties. So if you want to get a party that going this summer, come out to Balubaja, pick out some piñatas, and really add some pizzazz to your party. Thanks so much, Wayne. Oh, thanks for coming by. Appreciate it. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru. Your way on the parkway. Your car does more than get you where you need to go. It helps you live the life you love. At Capital Subaru, we're 100% dedicated to finding what works for you. And with a wide selection, personalized service, and plenty of perks, you won't need to go anywhere else to find it. Let us help you make the most of your day. Come shop your way on the parkway. Seek adventure this summer in the roomy and fuel-efficient new 2018 Subaru Impreza 2.0i all-wheel drive five-door. Lease it now, just $170 per month at Capital. Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Garden Time is going to Europe, and you can join us. Join Garden Time as we tour gardens in London, Paris, and Belgium. See world-famous gardens like Hampton Court, Kew, Sissinghurst, and Great Dixter, and Monet's Water Lily Garden in France. We'll also see sites in London and Paris, like the Tower Bridge and the Eiffel Tower. We'll also stop in the Champagne area of France, tour a Belgian brewery, castle gardens, and a winery. We'll also have a river cruise. Our final stop is a visit to the Floral Carpet in Brussels. We'll be staying in four-star hotels with 24 of your meals and your airfare included. Visit the Garden Time website and click on the tours link for all the details. And we'll see you in Europe. Well, it is getting to be summer, and with summer comes sun and then the summer drought. And so I'm with Christine, and Christine, you are here representing a great organization. What is that? That's a regional water providers consortium. It's a group of 21 public water providers in the Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah County area. And um, the group focuses on a lot of different things, but the thing that we're going to talk about today is um, water conservation and plants and gardening, because that's appropriate right now. It is appropriate. And I think when we think about water um, conserving and plants that do that, it's like we're thinking of, oh, I have to put cactus in, or I can only put sedums in. But really, you've selected a wide range of plants that are beautiful that can be drought tolerant um, after they're established. Correct, yeah. So there's many plants. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about um, their gardening practices and what can we do to make sure that we're not wasting water outside, because that is the biggest. I mean, you know, customers will use about three times more water in the summer than they do in the winter, so and it's all going outside. And the first thing I tell people is, really take a good look at your yard. What do you have to offer? What are the, you know, and every yard has little microclimates, like every area, every location might get a little more sun or a little more shade. It might be wetter here, or drier there, you know? And so know what you have first, and then you can go to the store. And one of the things that we wanted to point out today was you don't have to go to a specialty nursery oh, that's like, you know, 20 miles away. <laughs> go to Home Depot, go to Fred Meyers. And when you go and you're choosing a plant, one of the really important things to do is so you know what you have to offer. So now you find this plant, and you're like, oh, that's beautiful, I have to have it. Well, pick up the tag. The tag is going to tell you what that plant needs. You know, sun, partial sun, it's gonna tell you whether it's wet, wet, well-drained soils or it needs a uh, well-drained soils or wet soils or whether it needs, you know, something that's like completely dry. So that's what you want to do is check out that tag. What does that plant need? And then you decide, would it be appropriate for a location in your yard? And you know, we tell people that all the time, the right place for the right plant. Correct. And so it's not any different for drought tolerant plants. Right, exactly. And the, and the one thing too, to remember while the, you know, if you're choosing drought tolerant plants, when you first put them in the ground, they need ample amounts of water to get their feet, you know, to get their feet established and to be in there. But after about that first season and they're established, then you can really cut back and not really worry about watering them all the time. And I see that you have such a great selection here. I mean, you've gone from flowering plants to little shrubs to evergreen. It, there really is a wide, wide range of them. And you found them just at a local garden center. Yeah, yeah, we did, we did. And, and that's one of the fun things too, different textures. Ah, like, I'm a is. huge texture person when it, I rarely even look at the flower, which <laughs> kind of comes back to me later. But um, I love the texture difference. And, and um, yeah, so there's such a huge variety. Um, the consortium, we have a, 
uh, WaterWise plants for the Willamette Valley booklet that people can ask for and they can locate it um, on the website that's very, very helpful. It gives all the information about different plants all the way from grasses, trees, shrubs, oh, perennials, wow. you know, ground covers, the whole thing. So that's a really helpful book. Well, it's so wonderful that you've done all that research because mm -hmm. that's great. It takes it off our back. Yeah, yeah. And so where can we find that information? So conserveh2o.org uh -huh. is the website uh, for the Con Regional Water Providers Consortium. Well, there's so much information on that website. If you haven't been there, really go on it and check it out. It also has the weekly watering guide on it so that you know how much water to put down for the health of your plants. So much more information on it. So please go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over to that website and you can find out all the information. Thanks so much, Christine. Thank you. So it's an absolute delight to be out here with Roger at Gosler Farms Nursery. And Roger, today we're going to talk about one of the plants that so many, especially here in, in the Pacific Northwest, we know about rhododendrons. We think a lot of the natives. We all consider the beautiful blooms from them, but it's really a big family. And mm -hmm. so today we're going to talk to you about some of the rhododendrons that, of course, bloom, but their glory is their leaves, mm -hmm. right? Right. So what are we standing by here, first of all? This is Rhododendron Williamsianum. It's a Chinese species, um, totally hardy. It's been in the valley for probably 100 years kind of thing. Wow. And they'll have light pink, big bells, about, oh, two inches across, but very few of them, maybe 20 uh, per plant. But this, this foliage comes out, and it's this deep mahogany purple when it comes out, and then this beautiful green all summer. Wow, and evergreen? Right, totally evergreen. Wow, and then, so I'm on the mahogany, a mahogany, mahogany, it's right. kind of this color? Right, uh-huh. And so the whole shrub is that way? Right, uh-huh. Wow, wow. And this has gone through 12 below zero for us. My goodness, so certainly hardy to right. us in the Northwest. So there's a couple more over here. Let's take a walk over there okay. and we'll do some more looking at them. Good. Okay, Roger. <laughs> I gotta say that I know this is a rhododendron because I'm standing beside you, but it is a rhododendron. Mm -hmm. Look at those leaves. Mm -hmm. This is yakpak, which is Yakuzumanum, which is from Japan, southern part of Japan, across uh, Pacasanthum, which is from Taiwan. So it ends up being very hardy. This is about a 30-year-old plant. Uh, it's been through below zero several times. Oh, and and uh, white, pink to white flowers, but this incredible foliage all summer. And then all year round, it will have this very dark, rich, foliage and very clean, um, no insects that I've seen at all. And is that because of the, the soft covering on the leaf, do you think? From what I understand, the indomentum, the soft covering on top of the leaf and underneath the leaf keeps the, the lace bug from getting to the leaf wow. To, wow. to suck out the, the uh, fluids. And then does that just change because of time? Does the rain wash it off or all of those things Pretty together? much the sun and rain will wash it off. This one will hold it pretty well through the summer. By wow. September, this will start to really change and get these darker green leaves. Absolutely beautiful. But now we are gonna go look at one more. Let's step over okay. here and do that. Okay, again, it's a breathtaking plant just like this. So tell me about this one, what's its name? This is Rhododendron Pacasanthum, which is the, the parent of the yak pack. So it's from Taiwan. It's been totally hardy for us. This is probably a 25 year old plant. My goodness. And then uh, this beautiful foliage all summer and then light pink flowers. It didn't have many flowers this year. It's sort of off and on every other year kind of right. thing. But this incredible foliage all year round. Yeah, I mean, really Roger, when you look at this, there's so many things here in this garden that do have flowers. Even if this didn't for a couple of years, who would care because mm -hmm. this foliage is breathtaking. Yes, and it's very consistent every year like this. And we love consistency mm -hmm. in the garden. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Now, if you're thinking, man, William, where would I get some of these plants from that you're talking about? Well, you'd get them from Roger. Go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to their website. They're even, they even have mail order or better yet, come down and visit these gardens. Roger, my friend, thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Do you want to be green? Do the easy stuff first. Hi, I'm Sarah from Portland Nursery. The U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee says for every dollar spent on a shade tree, you can save five dollars on cooling, blocking the penetrating heat in the summer and allowing the warm rays through in the winter. Dollar for dollar, there's no better energy and money saver than a good, deciduous shade tree. Portland Nursery's professionals can help you make the perfect selection. 
Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Little Baja is your source for a whole lot of terracotta and concrete too. From bird baths and benches to Buddhas, bears and fountains, plus the exclusive Baja chimney, we have an amazing variety of the finest in terracotta and concrete containers. Come check out our selection of statuary for any garden theme or setting. So for something for the garden, deck, or patio, come see us at Little Baja on East Burnside in Portland. Find us on Facebook, too. When you plant your flower baskets and containers this year, consider Black Gold All-Purpose Potting Mix for the best results. This worm castings enriched, well-drained potting soil has a controlled release fertilizer to feed your plants up to six months. Black Gold All-Purpose Potting Mix now contains resilience for enhanced plant growth. Available at garden centers everywhere. For more information, visit blackgold.bz. All the riches of the earth. Well, if you're like me and you like to travel, and sometimes you travel a little long, you want to take a little thing off the road, get a nice place to stay, We've stayed in a lot of places, but I am out here at Village Green in Cottage Grove. Again, I'm with Ty, who happens to be the groundskeeper and head of all those people that help you make it look beautiful. And I have to say that pulling in here, getting one of the rooms, first of all, the rooms are charming. And then if you love plants, there's these amazing gardens. So tell me how have things been going here? Because it looks stunning. Absolutely. We have a very, very mature landscape around here. And uh, if you are interested in all things flora and you need a place to stay, this is, this is definitely a wonderful place. We have over 15 specialty gardens out here and 10 acres to, to wander around in and get lost. And it's just, it's, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. And I love that so many of the cottages, the, the, the rooms here, actually all have their own little private garden on them so you can step outside and yeah, be in absolutely. some privacy of your own space. Yeah, absolutely. It's very nice. And then tell me a little bit too about the wedding garden because we filmed there right from the beginning of it when it was started and mm -hmm. it's just lovely now. Absolutely. The wedding garden uh, obviously holds holds many weddings throughout right. the summer. We also call part of it the courtyard. Uh, it's one of our more formalized spaces out here at uh, Village Green and uh, yeah, it's, it's just wonderful. You know, it holds a lot of events and uh, it, it's adjoined by many rooms and, and the lounge. And I do remember, I, I'm pretty sure it was right after you got hired for this job, we came down here after a horrid oh winter weather storm. Oh my goodness. And tell me about that, because really I cannot see the effects of it. Well, <laughs> yeah, it was about two days a week for a month and then a day a week after that for a long time, just with saw chaps and chainsaws and tractors and ripping and tearing. And by gosh, we uh, we got it taken care of, but that's just adventures in gardening. You right. know, just keep moving forward. Okay, so you've had some years here now. Tell me, tell me just a couple of the places, a couple of the gardens that you really enjoy. Uh, I really enjoy, uh, one would be the pool area. We've got a lot of hardy bananas out right. there. And it's just like the way that it's been set up and designed is very nice. The, uh, the Tropicana Garden is absolutely wonderful. Uh, the Mahogany Garden uh, during the fall time is absolutely spectacular. And uh, one kind of weird spot uh, would be the Twilight Garden, which is actually inside of a very large um, uh, skip laurel. Really? Which, which seems kind of crazy, but you know, it's, it's kind of a nice spot out there, as well as the, uh, the labyrinth. I think that that's pretty right. charming and unique. Right. Yeah. Well, there you have it. You know, if you're ever down in the Eugene area or south of there, we would encourage you to come by and spend a wonderful evening or a weekend here at Village Green. So all you have to do is go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to the website that'll let you enjoy a beautiful room and a beautiful garden. Thank you a lot, Tom. Thank you. No matter what shade your green thumb is, you can find the plants and the help you need at Wavra Farms. We're filled with an astounding array of colorful plants to fill your garden. In addition to wonderful annuals and perennials, we are known for our hanging baskets. We also have all your garden essentials and we have great garden gifts too. From beginner to expert, you'll find something new and different with every visit. Wavra Farms, located off Highway 22, exit 5, east of Salem. The health and beauty of your garden starts from the ground up, and healthy soils begin at Grimm's Fuel. For the best in garden mulch, blended soils, and bark dust, choose Grimm's. U-Haul delivered or installed, Grimm's can do it. And if you're looking for a new lawn, Grimm's can do that too with our special lawn installation service. 
Grimm's is also the area's largest recycler of yard debris. The foundation for a healthy garden begins at Grimm's Fuel. In the summer months, water use can double or triple due to outdoor watering. Here are three simple tips to help save water and money this summer. Set your sprinklers so that they're watering your lawn and plants and not the pavement. Water early in the morning or later in the evening when temperatures are cooler. Group plants with similar water, shade, and sun needs together. For more water conservation information and tips, check out the Regional Water Providers Consortium at www.conserveh2o.org. I'm at Barn Owl Nursery with Chris, and Chris, you know, I think people love lavender in their garden. We love to have it, but sometimes we're afraid of it. Right. So you're going to help us take maybe the fear out of one aspect of it, and that's pruning. Yes, it's essential. It is essential because you want to keep these plants in your garden for years because you said you have plants over 15 years in yes. the garden. So what should we do? Can you show us? Yes, well, I use a sickle, but you could certainly use scissors. And this is my uh, first variety to harvest for culinary purposes. It's English lavender or lavandula and gustifolia French fields. And I'm going to take as long a stem as possible and then go ahead and leave um, a tiny bit of green on the woody stem or base below and take green on the stem so that you're actually getting the long stem and some of the foliage when you harvest. And I am really pruning at this time. And really, that's not going to hurt the plant, because I see some wood no. there. I don't see all green. Right. And this will grow. As you can see, there's some new growth in here. Look at that. And uh, once I finish harvesting, then I could water it again if I wanted to try to get a second crop of flowers later in the season. Oh, nice. Or um, add perhaps a little lime or fertilizer. But in general, um, you need to continue to prune hard at least once a year, and you can do that. Uh, several times, but um, if you only have time to do it once, I would say when you're harvesting would be the best. And then just to talk a little bit more about this variety, um, so it gets maybe about two foot tall. Mm -hmm. Very nice full sun, yes. really good garden variety. And it's important to plant English lavenders on three foot centers so they can get air circulation in between. And as you see, when they're heavy with flowers, they uh, tend to crowd together. And so if it rains, it's important to get those uh, long stems off, get the air inside to dry it out in between rain. Ah, and so enjoy it f um, fresh, dried, or even in some dishes. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a, some other lovely varieties over here, so let's go over there. Okay. These are some beautiful varieties, so tell us about them. The first one is Pacific Blue. It's a Lavandula angustifolia, or English Lavender, that gets 20 to 24 inches. And it has a nice deep color and is also a good culinary lavender. That is nice. And then this is a really nice one. I've never heard of this one, Rebecca yes, K. Yes, Rebecca K is also about the same size, 20 to 24 inches, with a nice dark flower. And it dries very well on the stem, as well as has culinary uses. The best thing about it is it blooms twice. That is nice. You don't hear about that too much with English lavender. No. And then this one, and the bees are having a good time. Yes, and this is a good example of when to harvest uh, for culinary purposes. And just a few of the little flowers or um, have opened from the buds and uh, the bees are busy working at each one of the stems and I will again cut as long a stem as possible into the foliage a little bit and wrap a small bundle together with rubber bands and hang them to dry and dry them usually within a week. And there really are so many different um, recipes. Man, when you go on the internet, there's lovely recipes yes, for that. Yes, there are. And then this, what's this last one? And this blooms a little bit later in the season. Royal Velvet is an English lavender that was developed and discovered and then uh, propagated in Oregon. Oh. And what's nice about it is it has a longer stem than some of the other angustifolias, and it has a nice, deep, dark flower um, bud as well as corolla or flower that opens up and so it's beautiful, fresh and dried and for culinary purposes. That is so nice. And you've gone and created this lovely handout that's going to be on the Garden Time website. So many different varieties, how big they grow, what the color is, what the uses are. Yes, I'm hoping that will help people decide what they have room to grow in their garden and um, decide what variety will work well in their landscape. 
And really, to come out today and tomorrow is really the perfect time to do all that research. Yes, yes. we have an open garden that is called Lavender Days. And uh, so it gets the opportunity for people to see different varieties of lavender growing and how we harvest and prepare it to um, dry for culinary purposes. Oh, that is right. And she has samples in the gift shop and you can taste different teas and lemonade. And really, it's a lovely event to come to. So if you have any other questions, please go to GardenTime.tv. We'll click over their website and find the directions and really come out and experience a lavender farm. Thanks so much. Thank you. So I'm standing here with Rich Barron. We're at the International Rose Test Garden. And, you know, we always talk about roses with Rich. And this time, we are going to talk about a specific rose again. But it is because, Rich, one of the roses, Peace, which you took a picture of many, many decades ago, that has now been chosen to be on U.S. postage stamps. How did that process happen? Well, it said the, the acquisitions editor for the USPS was looking for a picture of the Peace Rose and because I have a friend who they contacted first re referred them to me and I, I had the pictures and so I was more than happy to provide them. I didn't know it was going to be such a uh, public event on right. my behalf right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I love roses and I love showing the beauty of them and, right. and uh, the Peace Rose has been a favorite of mine. That particular flower bloomed on the very first plant I planted in my garden wow. 40 years ago this month. Well, and you know, uh, anybody who has any experience of, of how you've been in this industry and with roses, they know that you have been on the cover of a lot of rose magazines, you've had all kinds of uh, thousands of pictures in, in magazines and different things like that, postcards. This has got to make you go, wow, that, it's got to make you feel so good that that is going to be bought and used to mail stamps by millions of Americans. <laughs> That's got to make you feel proud. Well, I, I said, when, in a statement I made originally, I said, if people look at that stamp, if one or two people decide roses are worthy of growing because of the beauty of them, right. I will have done what I've been doing with pictures ever since I started, which is promoting people loving the rose. Well, there you have it. You know, this man has been a part of the Portland Rose Society for a very long time and has been very worthy in that cause of promoting roses. And now you too can buy stamps, promote the rose, and promote Portland. And Rich Bear. Thank you, Rich. What a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Now's the time. Standard TV and appliance store-wide sale going on now. Why wait? Fourth of July price cuts now on appliances and mattresses. Get a GE front load washer with steam, only $534. Or a Samsung stainless steel French door refrigerator, only $1049. Save big on a stainless steel Frigidaire dishwasher, only $299. Plus, get a Beauty Rest Queen mattress for just $399. Hurry, the store-wide sale won't last long. Standard TV and appliance. Hey everybody, I'm Brian Bauman from Bauman's Farm and Garden. The sun is out, it's summertime, and our hanging baskets are looking good. But uh, every once in a while, some things can go wrong. I'm going to talk about several different problems and how to solve them. Now you may have some of these, you may have none of these, but I'm going to kind of work our way through it and help you as we go. This basket is out front of our blue house in our parking lot. This is actually where I grew up and I noticed something wasn't quite right with this hanging basket. And upon closer look, you'll see some of that powdery stuff right on the top of the leaves. That's actually mildew. And it's not because you're a good gardener or a bad gardener that this happens. Just the sunny days and high humidity can cause mildew. So an easy way to take care of that is to use this neem oil. It's an all natural product. And essentially what it does is just kind of coat the fungus and gets rid of it. it Take several applications and you gotta make sure you hit the bad spots with it. So make sure you get up underneath and all around with the neem oil. I've checked this basket and I haven't seen any signs of insects yet, but it can be a problem. So before we come, we're gonna take some applications. This is actually a rose um, care product, but it has a systemic insecticide in it. And what this means is we're gonna take some of these granules, sprinkle them right in the top of our hanging basket, and as we water it, it's going to soak some of that product up into the leaves and kind of help us as a preventative measure to make sure it doesn't happen. But what happens when you do find maybe aphids or cutworms on your hanging basket? 
There's a couple different products you can use and depending on how many you have, kind of will tell you on which product you want to start with. The first one is Captain Jack's. This is an all natural product. In fact, it's just some bacteria that they once found in a rum distillery. You spray this product directly onto the flowers and the foliage and when those nasty little worms or aphids bite into that, they're done for the season. So what do you do if there are lots of cutworms or lots of aphids that have come on your hanging basket? A product that we really liked is called Eight. And kind of a tip or trick to remember when you're picking out the right product, this particular one hooks onto your hose. This is what they call Ready to Spray or RTS. The Captain Jacks that we were on before was an RTU or just a ready to use. But in this case, if we've got lots of them on there, I like to pick up the Ready to Spray. You just hook this onto the end of the hose, spray down your whole hanging basket, and on contact, takes care of everything. And for one last tip, if your hanging basket starts to stretch and start looking for the sunlight maybe, it's always easier to go in and trim off some of that old growth so then it can flush new growth. It's always easier for it to grow new ones than to repair the old ones. And for more information, go to www.bowenfarms.com. At Garland Nursery, you'll find top quality plants, four generations of garden know-how, fun and fantastic garden decor, and the best in garden supplies. Come visit us at Garland Nursery. Since 1937, inspiring beautiful and bountiful gardens. Well, I am at Northwest Garden Nursery with Marietta and Ernie O'Byrne. And so Ernie, I've only been here for hellebore time and I've never been here this late in the season and it's spectacular, I think, any time of the year. Oh, well, thank you very much. So yeah. when did you move here? How did this all start? Well, we uh, bought the property, Marietta bought the property in 72 and we got together in 77 and I had a farm over in no tie. A uh, great property, but not a very great house. So we decided her house was better, so <laughs> I sold my property and moved in here. <laughs> and the garden started from about 85 on. We had water problems before mm -hmm. that, uh, just low quantity. And um, then we drilled some wells and things improved a bit. Uh, we still have to be careful, but um, uh, from that time on, about 85, uh, and then we started a nursery. Uh, we did landscape maintenance and uh, started a nursery to be able to help people install in areas of their garden. And then Roger Gosler <laughs> said, well, why don't you just start a nursery? And we said, well, we're doing landscape maintenance. And he said, well, just open on Saturday. <laughs> so that's what we did for many years and then we did uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and then we got interested in hellebores. Ah. So. Well really you had to have some kind of a nursery to grow plants because you have so many interesting plants that you probably couldn't find anywhere at that time. Well that was the challenge is we loved, we were plant collectors really. Mm. We grew from seeds, a lot of seed exchanges and traveled all over the world and collected plants and uh, so the challenge was to put them into a pleasing arrangement in the garden, even though it was a plant selection. Because there's so many different plants. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes you could see that somebody really likes this kind of plant or that kind of plant mm -hmm. or from China or from somewhere else, but really you have so many different kinds. Well, we really do love plants. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we see plants and then we, uh, you know, we've never been... Uh, collectors of one genera, like mm -hmm. some people do. They're, our tastes are pretty eclectic. And really, there's something going on at any time. I mean, the hellebores are the star of the show in the late winter, early spring, but really now there's so much going on. There is. That's one of the things we do strive to do, is have interest in the garden at all times of year. And really, people can come out any time of the year, but you really need a heads up so you're home, correct? Right. <laughs> Yeah, we do need to be home. There's a closed gate, so you're welcome to drive by and take a chance. If the gate's <laughs> open, you're welcome to come in, but um, the gate may be closed. 
<laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to talk to Marietta about this book. And so right. we are so fortunate in Oregon here that there's so many authors and authors with interesting things to say. And Marietta, the book is just lovely. Oh, and you. it's called A Tapestry Garden. And so how did this all come about? Well, I'll have to tell the story of Tom Fisher. <laughs> Tom Fisher is the acquisition editor at Timber Press. And he has a way of talking uh, <laughs> and leaving out some details that make writing a book sound very easy. <laughs> just write 40,000 words, a few chapters, and just like several articles, and that's it. Well, there's a lot more to it, but that's how the book happened. And once we got involved and realized there's a lot more to it, it was too late. So we had to finish <laughs> <You're committed>. it. <laughs> right, we were committed. Marietta, the book is called A Tapestry Garden, so mm -hmm. what were you trying to accomplish in all that? I think we wanted to share our love of plants and gardening, basically. Now, we did go through different phases according to the soils uh, here that were already there. We knew woodland garden was the first because there were some big leaf maples here that don't exist anymore, so we started gardening under them. We had very little water, so that was a constraint. Then we got into rock garden and alpine plants, <laughs> which don't take up much room and much water. So all around the house, there are alpine plants. And then Ernie said, oh, how about a conifer garden? So it got stretched out. Conifers don't need much water, but they were boring. I mean, to me, just <laughs> conifers. So I started planting in between. Then we also had a vegetable garden, very useful. Well, the soil was very good there because we used a lot of amendments. Well, it got too big, so how about perennials, beautiful flowers? And then you kind of wove that all together till today's garden. Yeah, today's garden now, because we started with a woodland garden under trees, we started with the alpine garden in an open area. It was, goes from room to room, so to speak. Uh, in the vegetable garden, which also is perennial garden, the chaparral garden, which is a dryland garden. It all had its own area, so yes, it is all not really divided up, but you wander from one right. garden into the next. Right, and through this book, you can really see every one of those rooms, and you really have to come down here. So put that on your list to make an appointment to come on down here, and really, this book is something to see. It's got the lovely pictures that show it at any time of the year. So if you're interested in this book, please go to one of your favorite bookstores or to go to Timber Press. Thank you so much, it's a lovely book. Thank you for inv inviting us. Thank you for watching Garden Time today, and thanks to Barn Owl Nursery for letting us hang out. Now don't forget to stop over today and tomorrow to see the beautiful display gardens and get some lovely lavender. We also wanted to let you know that there have been a couple of cancellations to our trip to Europe this August. So if you're still interested in going, go to gardentime.tv and click on the airplane. And we did want to tell you that today is our last hour show of the season, but we will return to our half hour show through the end of November next week. So for more information, please go to gardentime.tv. Thanks again for showing us the kindness of your time today, and we'll share it all again next week, right here on Garden Time. Judy, oh, what? what are you doing? William, I'm trying to find gardening events in my area. And you're having a hard time doing I that? I am having a hard time. You know, all you have to do is go to gardentime.tv and look at the events page. Ah, that is great news. <laughs> so if you're looking for gardening events in your area, just go to gardentime.tv. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.